1 Kings 19, verse 12. After the earthquake came a fire. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. But the Lord was not in the fire. That's why you can't miss church, y'all, because this is a Netflix series. We just keep going. We're going to keep building on the last revelation. You can't get left behind. The Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak. He pulled his what? His cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Woo, the mouth of the cave. The cave will speak to you. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here? Elijah. Jump down to verse 15. Verse 15. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. Paul, Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. And then I want you to anoint, and I'm just going to paraphrase the next few verses. I want you to anoint a guy named Jehu, and I want you to anoint a guy named Elisha. Verse 19. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up. He went up to him, threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. He said, hey, let me, let me kiss my father and my mother goodbye, and then I'll come with you. Watch what happens here. Go back, Elijah replied. Go back. There's that phrase again, go back. Go back. Remember in 1 Kings 18, he told the, seventh, the servant seven times, go back. And then God whispers to him at the mouth of the cave and says, go back the way you came. And now he's telling Elisha upon meeting him, go back. Go back. What have I done to you. Verse 21, and we're going to stop here. So Elisha left him, went back, took his yoke of oxen, slaughtered them, burnt the plowing equipment to cook the meat, gave it to the people. They ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and become his servant. I want to preach a message, and I wrestled with the title, but I think this one is the most befitting. I'm going to preach a message today called Battles, Bruises, and Batons. Battles, bruises, and batons. Do me a favor, tell somebody, you got battles, you got bruises, but you got batons. Lord Jesus, breathe on your word, do something unique in this room. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I went to high school in a city about three hours, three and a half hours from here called Warner Robins, Georgia. Any Georgia people in the room? Yeah, middle Georgia, Warner Robins, Georgia um, is where I went to high school at. And I went to the county high school. It's spelled Houston, but it's pronounced Houston County High School. Now, when I was there, we were um, the worst at every single sport that we played. Uh, but we, we housed this sporting event called the Bear Brawl. Now, the Bear Brawl was this winter tournament, basketball tournament, that was a big, 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 big deal. From the Bear Brawl, you could get a trophy, you can get bragging rights. It was a big deal. Everybody wanted to, to win the Bear Brawl. Schools would travel from near and far to participate in this basketball tournament called the Bear Brawl. Something interesting would happen. I would go to other high schools when we played them, and all these high schools had trophy cases. And in many of the trophy cases, they had the Bear Brawl championship trophy. But guess who high school didn't have the trophy? The high school I went to that hosts, how you host a tournament that you never win? <laughs> we never had a trophy to our own tournament. And I would go to these high schools and I would see their trophy cases and they have Bear Brawl, they'll have championships, 5A champion, 6A champion, baseball, football, basketball, all this stuff. And, and they had these trophies in there that were won, hear me, by athletes who existed before the students ever arrived to the school. Because wins are inherited. Wins are passed down. And ladies and gentlemen, this is why your children won't have to fight some battles that you already won. 
because wins are inherited. Your children's children will see trophies that mama and daddy won. They're going to be able to walk through the hall of fame of your life and see trophies that daddy won over perversion and mama won over depression and daddy won over poverty and mama won over insecurity. They'll be able to see the trophies that you have. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm not talking about metal and metal trophies because Grammys and Emmys will fade away. No, I'm talking about spiritual trophies. I'm talking about trophies that they'll be able to reflect and say, I got more from my mom and daddy than just my looks and their tendencies. No, I inherited their victories. Is there anybody in this room that knows that you're in the business of passing down wins? Wins, 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 wins. For 40 years, the Israelites marched through the wilderness on their way to the promised land after leaving Egypt. And they had many battles. If you study history, they fought against the Canaanites. They fought against the Amorites. They fought against the Amalekites. They fought against all these people. But you know, one group of people they never fought against in the wilderness. You ready for this? The Egyptians. Because the Bible said in, in Exodus 14 that the enemy, the Egyptians you see today, you'll never see again. And can I suggest to you, maybe this is why the warfare over your life has been so intense. Because God wants you to cancel, hear me, some enemies that your children won't ever have to deal with. I know I didn't come to preach to any and everybody, but I wish I had 22 people that'll jump up and jump back down and say, my child won't deal with that. Come on. That giant has been slain. My child won't deal with that. They might have some battles, but they won't deal with that. There are some battles, hear me, that are ending with you. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, you can't give up. Because not only are you carrying bruises, to carry a baton. In 1 Kings chapter 18, I need you to catch what I'm dropping. I'm going to do my best. In 1 Kings chapter 18, we've been in this text, verse 41 through 46, where we see Elijah. Elijah says, I hear the sound of heavy rain. He tells the servant, he says, hey, go check it for me. I hear the sound of heavy rain. And the Bible says that the servant goes to check. He comes back seven times. He don't see nothing. But just because you don't see anything does not mean that God is not moving. Woo! Just because it's small, hear me, does not mean that God is not isn't it? Because what began as a cloud the size of a man's hand, the Bible says, turned into many clouds that sent down heavy rain. And so Elijah tells the king, he says, hey fam, I need you to get ahead of it. This is what I want to read in verse 46. They put it up prematurely, but now you can, I release you to put the verse up. The Bible says, the power of the Lord came on Elijah and tucking his cloak in his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Jezreel. You know you can't just read the Bible. You got to read the Bible. The word Jezreel means the Lord sows. In other words, it is a prepared place. God is accelerating you to a place that he's already prepared for you. I ain't got no help over here. Let me come over here. God is accelerating you to a place that he already has prepared for you. And so God is so proactive. He's not a procrastinator. He's not getting the place ready for you. He's getting you ready for it. Because he's already sown it. And so I gave you on New Year's Eve seven prophetic declarations. Somebody already got the tattoos. Congratulations. Number one, new records will be set. Ahab rode, Elijah ran. Number two, here comes the wind. And this wind is not coming to block you. It's coming to back you. Number three, my favorite, the drought is over. Get up and eat. In other words, go ahead and start acting like your future is now, not just on the way. Number four, you're going higher and deeper in the spirit. Elijah climbed higher but lowered his posture. Number five, this is your year for unwavering faith. Come on, not just this TikTok, back and forth, wishy-washy stuff. No, no, no. You're going to be able to be steadfast and unmovable. You're going to be able to be, watch me, anchored in the Lord. Unwavering faith with a sound mind. Number six, no more tripping. You're going to tuck some things in this year so that you don't trip over the same thing anymore. And number seven, you will finish faster what took some 10 years God's going to do before, for you before the 10th month of October. There is a speed that God can move to get things accomplished 10 years in 
one day. Ahab, Ahab now, he, he gets on his horse and chariot because at the word of the Lord, Elijah says, hey amen, get on your horse and chariot, hitch up your chariots and your horses and get ahead of it. So Ahab gets ahead of it. Watch the Bible. He gets on his horses and chariots and he gallops all the way home. He pulls up into the driveway of his kingdom and his ratchet, trifling, no good wife by the name of Jezebel, you heard that name before. Jezebel come walking out the house. She looked like Shanene. She said, welcome home. <laughs> and Ahab says, girl, you won't believe the kind of day I had. You won't believe what happened. He said, see, we was on the mountain. You had to be there. Elijah called fire down from heaven, slayed 450 false prophets of Baal. You had to, be. you ever try to tell somebody something and you just like, you just had to be there. You just had to be there, girl. This man, you remember three years ago, he said it wasn't going to rain no more, not even dew was going to be on the ground. Well, this man said, I hear rain coming. He wasn't lying. Look outside. It's rain. I said, you won't believe this. Not only that, but I got up on my horses and chariot and started galloping all the way home. And I looked up, and this dude outran me 31 miles all the way from Two Knots to Sumter, South Carolina. I ran my horses for 31 miles, and Jezebel looks at him. And she's not impressed with his testimony. Don't you hate when you were excited about something God did, and you told the wrong person? Uh, the wrong person will try to kill woo, what you are excited about. And here she go with her nasty self. She want to kill Elijah. She said, by this time tomorrow, may the God deal with me ever so severely if he not dead. She puts out a death threat on this man, Elijah. And now he shifts from a powerful prophet to a frightened fugitive off of one shout, off of one threat. He shifts from a victor to a victim off of one shout, off of one threat, from a winner to a whiner, off of one shout, off of one threat, from the penthouse to the projects, off of one shout, off of one threat. Just one shout sends this man one shout is loud enough to shut Elijah down. Has life ever got noisy for you? Has it ever got so noisy on your job that you started questioning your passion? Have it ever got so noisy at your house that you just wanted to leave everybody? Not forever, but just for like a month. You just need 30 days kids free. Come on, don't look at me like that. I just, I'm okay with them being a month older when I get back. I just need time. <laughs> when life gets noisy. But I love the Bible woo, for many reasons. One reason I love it is because you'll never find your God in a shouting match with the devil. I feel like preaching. What one shout did for this woman God counseled it, hear me, with one whisper. God's whisper has more authority than the devil's shout. Did you hear what I just said? God's whisper has more authority than the devil's shout. You should try it out sometime. Just whisper his name and watch demons tremble. Just whisper his praise and watch your atmosphere shift. Just whisper his promises and watch your body come into alignment. God's whisper has more authority than the devil's shout. And God's whisper has this authority, hear me. Because it's packed with truth. And it'll find you at your lowest place if you just listen. It's packed with truth. It's packed with what? Truth. Jezebel, hear me, she's loud, but her shouts are as false as the God she serves. And God whispers his truth. And the Bible says, she tells him, by this time tomorrow, you're going to be dead. It's a lie. Elijah not only outlives a lie, but the Bible says two chapters later, he gives her a real prophecy of how she's going to die. Because he's empowered, watch me now, by a whisper. 
And this is why I got to get to the presence of God. Because life will get so noisy, it'll have me depressed over something that's a lie. It'll have me dealing with anxiety over something that's a lie. But if I can just touch the hem of his garment, if I could just hold on to the horns of the altar, if I could just get in his presence, that's why I come on Tuesday morning at 6 a.m. And that's why I'm here every Sunday that I'm able because if I can get in his presence, then maybe I can get a whisper. And is there anybody in this room that knows? you've been empowered and strengthened by the whisper of your God his whisper will find you in your low place it'll find you when you're feeling alone in your bedroom it'll find you when nobody else picking up the phone and notice notice now I got a lot to give you 27 minutes notice how Elijah has supernatural acceleration the rain comes that's supernatural abundance But after the acceleration and after the abundance came the affliction. I'm going to say it again. After acceleration and after abundance, expect affliction. Expect it. Why do we keep getting caught off guard? Well, we don't want bothering the enemy first. Have you ever felt like that? Let me just get, I'm, let me get undeep for a second and just get practical. Have you ever felt like life was good as long as you was wilding out? And the moment you even made up your mind to put the new port down, <laughs> the moment you made up your mind, I'm going to do it. You went home. You got all the great goose and just poured it all in. The, I'm done. I'm done. The moment you made up your mind to try to make better, healthier, more wholesome choices, it's like the devil just got louder. Can I tell you something? Expect it. Because you started the fight. He don't have to bother you when you're helping him destroy yourself. That's why he'll massage your feelings in that toxic relationship. The man slapped you upside your head, but at least he gave me something for Christmas. Child, no, get out of that house. But the moment you say, for God I live, for God I die, it feels like our hell is breaking loose. It's because it is. Expect it. Because you're making the devil nervous. And he only bothers those who bother him. If you're not a threat, he won't mess with you. But is there anybody in this room that the devil's been messing with, but you're so glad you serve a God who is stronger, whose whisper is stronger than the shout of the enemy, whose touch is stronger than the flex of the enemy. Come on. He has more power in his look than the enemy got in all his forces. But expect it. Expect it. Why, Trav? Because your anointing will be tested. I don't know you're anointed by your speed or your surplus. I know you're anointed by how you handle suffering. This is three messages in one, Jamal, and I told myself I wasn't going to do this no more, but I just had to get it all out. It's not a popular subject, suffering. If you want to kill a church and have them not shout, talk about suffering. Because when we talk about prosperity and happiness, we all go running. But when we talk about the times that God allows you to go through a wilderness. When we talk about the time, Job, that God allows your body to be afflicted with pain, ain't nobody want to shout right there. And that's our problem. We don't expect affliction. We don't expect suffering. So whenever anything go, don't let our great, great grandmama die. Now God ain't good no more. Whenever life don't go in the way we expect it to, we're looking at God like, where are you Santa Claus? Like he owe us something. But the Bible says in this life, you will have trouble. It's a promise. And there are times, here we go, where God in his sovereignty 
please hear the words that are coming out of my mouth, will allow you to go through some stuff so he can introduce you to another side of him. I could go home and get fried chicken right now. Chris, we worked out. Can I have fried wings today? There are times when God in his sovereignty will guide you through some stuff oh God, to introduce you to another version of him. If I had time, I would park right there. But all you need to know is that without the mouth of the cave, Elijah don't meet the whispering God. And the Bible says, I feel my help. Psalms 119, 71. The Bible says, it was good. I need you to look back at the devil's best shot and confuse him and call it good. It was good. It was good that they left me. It was good that they betrayed me. It was good that I went through that. It was good that I struggled. It was good. The food dance, good. Poverty, good. Come on up here. It was good that I was afflicted. Why? That I might learn. You don't learn God in seminary, you learn him in suffering. It was good. Quit crying. It was good. Quit weeping about that. It was good. You've been calling it the wrong thing and as long as you don't see it as education, you'll always discount the seasons that God allowed you to walk through. Do you hear the words that are coming out of my mouth? I don't need everybody. I got 20 more minutes to bring this thing home, but I need about 100 people that are throwing your hands up and say thank you for every struggle. Thank you for every tear. Thank you for every sleepless night. Thank you. It was good that I was afflicted that I might learn your decrees. Affliction taught me something. I have people call me all the time, all the time from all over the world, old and young, want to talk about how do you grow and start a mega church? Like, give me the secret. Like, what, what, what? Affliction? I'm going to have to call you back. I think something wrong with my phone. I don't, I don't. How did you learn how to balance music and ministry? Affliction? How do you get a healthy marriage and kids who respect y'all and love you? It's called, ladies and gentlemen, affliction. Affliction educated me. Affliction matured me. Affliction grew me up. My wisdom came through the stuff I went through. And I don't have depth nor authority over anything I have not overcame. Songs hit different. When you got a story. And there's some people, and I ain't mad at you. Do you, boo? Some people can just chill. Some folks, it don't take much. Don't let somebody say, I've had some good days. They're like, wait a minute. I've had some hills to don't let somebody say, I don't know how, but you did it. And you just have a flesh. Your song is connected to a story. Don't let somebody say, never would have made it. You'd be about to lose your mind. And folks looking at you like, why are you praising God the way you praising him? Because my affliction taught me something. I met him as a provider when I needed him the most. I met him as a healer. How did you meet him? I met him in a hospital room. How did you meet him? I met him in a jail cell. How did you meet him? I met him in an unemployment line. Is there anybody in this room that met him? In 
the lowest place of your life he'll find you it was good it was good you got 12 seconds to praise him like you know all things work together for your good it was good it was good expect affliction I haven't started preaching yet I got so much to give you expect affliction sit down expect please because I can stay here all day expect affliction because the enemy will always present you with hurdles that he knows can distract you Jesus and this is why Peter wrote in 1 Peter 4 12 he says dear friends please don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through quit being surprised by drama quit being surprised by storms as if something strange were happening to you. He said, perhaps do this instead. Be very glad. For these things make you partners. <laughs> My struggle has partnered me with him. I'm partnered in Christ in his sufferings. In his sufferings. Battles will show up. Hear me when you least expect them. Battles will show up when you least expect them. Have you ever been having a good day? He was like, I just didn't see that coming. See, when you read this text, if you're not careful, you'll just grab things out of it without really getting yourself ingratiated into the context of the content. I need you to place yourself into what is happening right here, right now. Elijah is perhaps having his greatest and most successful day in ministry. This man calls fire from heaven. From, some of y'all breath be kicking like fire, but he <laughs> literally it was right there. I couldn't, I couldn't, it was an alley oop, like it was easy. <laughs> he caused fire from heaven, slays 450 false prophets in one day. Go from there to the top of the mountain, gets in his prayer posture, and says, uh-oh, I hear the sound of heavy rain. In fact, it didn't rain in three years. That's a long time, but I hear it coming. Tell the king, hey, press, get ahead of it. The king get on Air Force One and get ahead of it. It's all in one day, ladies and gentlemen. Go from there to outrunning Air Force One. The king lands at the White House. First lady walks out. <laughs> at the height, hear me, hear me, hear me. At Elijah's ministry, he gets a notification from the White House that he's on the country's most wanted list. The battle hit him when he least expected at his highest point. No trophy, just trouble. And I believe as I was reading this, the Lord just would not stop speaking. My kids kept coming to bother me. I said, y'all get out. God is speaking to me. My wife FaceTimed me and said, hey, where that video? I said, baby, the Lord is speaking to me. I believe one of the reasons, hear me, if you don't hear nothing else, I believe one of the reasons, this is really deep what I'm about to say, I believe one of the reasons Jezebel's threat tripped Elijah, one of the reasons it was so loud is because he had been fighting all day.
He battled 450 false prophets spiritually. His faith battled a servant that was giving him a negative report. He battled physically to outrun horses for 31 miles. I said, Lord, why was the man so quick to go to depression? He said, Travis, you ready for this? It's deep. Because he was tired. And trouble will always outshine trophies when you're tired. Tweet that. Trouble will always outshine trophies when you're tired. Ain't it funny when you're tired, everything get on your nerve? He was tired. The boy was bruised from all the battles he had overcome. And that's why you can't judge bruised people. Because you don't know what it took for them to even show up. Do me a favor. Before you give your spouse a list of things to complain about, would you at least have discernment to see if they bruised from that day at work? Would you at least, at least have the discernment to see if they're emotionally bruised by some season that they just survived? The man plummeted into depression practically because he was just tired. And this is why the Bible says when you read it, the man, when he ran away, the first thing he did was took a nap. The angel woke him up, said, eat something. He ate it, said, cool. Went back to sleep. He was tired. And when you're tired, your bruises are always more apparent. But I came to preach to a few people to tell you you're bruised, but you're not broken. Would you say that with me? I'm bruised, but I ain't broken. Uh-uh. I don't know. I thank you for feeling sorry for me. Thank you for the counseling section. But please don't have pity because I ain't broken. I am a survivor. I've overcome some stuff in my life and I'm bruised. I'm battered, but I ain't broken. How you know you ain't broken? Because I'm still here. I still got praise. I still got joy that the world didn't give in the world can't take it away. The Bible says in Psalm 34 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them are what? Here's that word. Broken. I'm bruised, but I'm not broken. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4 8. He says we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven into despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. I might be bruised, but I ain't broken. I might have to lift my weight, but I'm still moving. Is there anybody in this room that know the devil gave me your best shot, but you're still here? I ain't broken. I'm almost done. The devil can't break you. Ah. Uh, he might bully you, but he can't break you. And this is why you're bruised, but you always bounce back. Do you want to know the secret to why you always bounce back, Kyrie? Because you ain't the only one bruised. The Bible says in Isaiah, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace is upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. I ain't the only one bruised. He got stripes for that. I ain't the only one bruised. He went through that, hear me, so he could understand me at my lowest point. I serve a God who gets me. I serve a God who understands me. I serve a God who won't turn away on the bruised version of me. Is there anybody in this room or anybody watching all over the world that can testify he gets me? But like Jesus, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Like Jesus, bruises evolve. Bruises transform. Bruises become batons. You have authority over what you overcome. Yeah. 
you have authority over that which you overcome. We overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. My testimony is my badge of authority. Saying, devil, you already tried this and you failed. My testimony is my badge of admittance into any space to let you know I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt, but I'm a survivor. Is there anybody in this room that know you got authority over what you over Elijah was afflicted, bruised, and in a cave. Elijah was afflicted, bruised, and in a cave. Elijah was afflicted, bruised, and in a cave. I call it the ABCs of ministries. You're going to be afflicted. You're going to be bruised. And there's going to be seasons you find yourself in a cave. A, B, C, D. But you're not done. I need 10 people that'll testify. I've been through some stuff, but he's not done with me yet. I still got a story. I still got authority. I still got a call on my life. I still got destiny. I still got an anointing. Afflicted, bruised, in a cave, but I ain't done. Why? Because he ain't done with me. Yes. And Elijah, come here, Elijah. The reason you're not done is because you still have something to give. I want to talk to you in the very back. The reason you're not done is because even though you don't feel like it, you still have something to give. But I had an abortion. You still have something to give but I got a diagnosis you still have something to give but I'm divorced you still have something to give your mentorship hear me your guidance your impartation is the answer to someone's prayer someone is waiting on you to get up. Elijah, you're not done because someone is waiting on what you carry. If you give up, they can't get started. It ain't about you. And the Bible says in 1 Kings 18, 46, I hope you didn't miss it. The power of the Lord came on Elijah and tucking in his cloak, he ran. And then the Bible says in 1 Kings 19, 19, Elijah went and found Elisha plowing oxen and he went up and threw his cloak on Elisha. And the Bible says, at the mouth of the cave, God speaks to Elisha and covering his face with his cloak, he tucks, covers, and gives. Tucks, covers, and gives. Because what you tuck, you transfer. Let's go to Taco Bell, man. I'm done. What you tuck, you transfer. You ready? What you don't tuck, you transfer. This is the year. You got it? This is the year to tuck and not trip because you're carrying a baton. And whatever you don't tuck, Elijah, you run the risk of damaging. Imagine Elijah moving at this speed 
dragging something untucked. Now he has to pass down not victories but damaged goods. And many of us in this room are recipients of damaged goods. Something your daddy never tucked in. Something your pastor never tucked in. I ain't scared of you. Something your mentor never tucked in. And now you received, hear me, a mismanaged mantle. I told you, I don't know if I got better this year. This is four messages. How long will you continue to mismanage the mantle on your life? How long will you make excuses about having things in your life untucked? A prayer life that you just refuse. I, I need, I'd rather Netflix and chill. I'm not saying don't look at Netflix. I'm saying at least tuck it in enough to get a word so you have something of value to pass. If the only wisdom you can give somebody comes from Olivia Pope, about this year we tuck in pig feet oh see y'all just want to y'all just want to talk bible I just all the black folks just got mad at me just right I, I feel it you beaming at me some of you brewing your, your pig feet right now they at home just waiting on you your hog mog and your cheddar loins Because your mama never tucked in her high cholesterol. This the way I grew up, and now your mama is 63 years old with gout and can't even. I ain't picking. I'm saying somebody got to start passing victories. Let them be a kid. Give them pizza, but every now and then, give them a green bean. Every now and then, give them some vegetables. Every now and then, instead of just handing them an iPad, teach them a Bible story. Because your battles and bruises will have you wanting to give up. Elijah wanted to throw in the towel. God wanted him to throw his cloak. Because God always has a future in mind. God always has a future in mind. God always has a future in mind. So when he whispers something to your spirit today, it's not just about today. And it's not just about yesterday. The whispering God has the future in mind because he's there already. He's not just alpha, he's omega, I gotta let y'all go. And so God whispers in chapter 19, verse 13. He says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And then he whispers in verse 15, go back the way you came and anoint. And then in verse 16, he whispers, anoint Elisha. He whispered Elisha's name before Elijah ever knew he existed. He already had the future in mind. He whispered, Hazel, Jehu, Elisha. Guess what Jehu did, you ready? He killed Jezebel. And Elisha didn't just inherit a mantle didn't just inherit a baton. He inherited victories. And I came to announce a word over this church. There will be no more mismanaged mantles. The cycle stops here. I'm done. Hear me. Today's talk is tomorrow's transfer. Today's tuck is tomorrow's transfer. 
Yeah, I want you to tug so you'll stop tripping, but I also want you to tug so that you can transfer victories. It is time for us to start setting up the next generation for wins. How long, if this is your pastor talking in love, how long will we continue to be selfish? You in your late 30s and you still cheating? Still? Like, you, you, I get it when you're 21. You're 38 and you're still trying to prove to yourself that you got it. You 52 at homecoming, still? If you don't shit, you're rusty. How long will we keep living for us? And our kids are getting shot in the street because they don't have mantles or mentors or people who will pass them wins. Our kids are getting locked up every weekend because instead of teaching them how to cut the grass and wash the car and be a real man, all you want to do Let's keep running the streets. How long? Are we going to mismanage mantles? And I get it. Your daddy was a cheater. I get it. I get it. We'll counsel. We'll have therapy. We'll cry about it. But how long would that be your excuse to raise another cheater? Or will you be like God in Exodus 14 and says the cheaters you see today you will never see again. The drug dealers you see today, you'll never see again. The adulterers you see today, you'll never see. The porn addictors you see today, you'll never see again. It stops here. And if I got anybody in this room that's ready to pass on some victories, that know you've been through some battles, that know that you've been through some bruises, but recognizes the responsibility of your baton, would you give your God 20 seconds of a good praise let you know he who has begun a good work is faithful to perform it he's faithful to finish what he started he's faithful now unto him who is able to keep me from falling lift your hands you have been so good to me God I can't believe how you love me Woo. what a friend you have been you've been so good to me oh God I can't believe how you love me. I want to do a specific prayer in this room and I'm gonna put I'm gonna put them together both those who are recommitting your heart to God for the first time and the first time in a long time. And those who are in this room who are tired of being a victim to the cycle. Someone dragged something and didn't tuck it and handed it to you and you keep tripping over something that should have been tucked a long time ago. Today is your day of freedom in Jesus' name. Today is your day of freedom in Jesus' name. Come on, I need you to look at somebody and tell them that thing is broken now. I'm going to count the three. Hands are going to go up all over this room and all around the world. Saying, I want Jesus. I'm tired of playing games. I'm giving my heart the first time or the first time in a long time. And or I'm ready for this thing to be broken off of me. And I want prayer for that. You ready? It's your moment. One, two, three. Lift that hand high. Lift that hand high. Hands are up everywhere. Yes, Lord. 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 Hey, if there's a hand lifted around you, would you put a hand on her shoulder? So good to me. Woo! So my ready to be. Hey, hear me. He's not mad at you. 
He's madly in love with you. So good to me. Oh God, I can't believe. What a friend. You've been so good. Oh God. Hey, we're going to pray together. I want you to repeat after me, everybody. Lord Jesus, I give you my heart. I give you my mind. All that I am belongs to you completely. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. And thank you for getting up so I don't have to stay down. I receive you today as my Lord and my Savior. I thank you that that thing stops today. The thing that was handed to me, the chain that I couldn't break, I thank you that you've broken it by your power. The whispering God is calling my name. Would you give them a praise right here, right there? Come on. Hey, hey, family, thank you for checking out this week's message. I pray something was said or done that can inspire you to live a transformed life in Jesus Christ. I believe that the future is waiting on you and you're about to move into it. So make sure you like and subscribe right now to the YouTube page so you can check out all the messages every week right here. Love you.